Welcome friends to the ninth video of our web series called VKC The Power of 30. Through these web series we intend to release 30 episodes covering different areas of corporate, securities and financial laws. The topic for today's session is financial instruments and overview covering the three indices applicable on financial instruments visually indice 32, indice 109 and indice 107. At the outset financial instruments are perceived as one of the most complex topics in Indian accounting standards. But before beginning, it is worth mentioning that India has been one of the leaders in terms of implementation of these standards. Globally, these standards are replicated by IAS 32, IFRS 9 and IFRS 7. IFRS 9 is originally effective globally from 1st January 2018. However, in India, the phase 1 companies who have implemented NDS have transitioned to NDS with effect from 1st April 2016 with an opening balance sheet of April 2015. Uh, due to the requirements of competitors. Therefore, to sum up, India has adopted much before its global implementation. The standards dealing with financial instruments have interactions with several other standards as well. Every standard will have some reflection or the other of these standards because the contra side of many journal entries in some of those topics fall within the purview of these standards. So let's begin today's presentation. This presentation should be seen as an introductory to the respective topic. For in-depth analysis and discussion, you may reach out to us at the email IDs provided in the description below. As already mentioned, the financial instrument standard is a trio or a combination of three accounting standards. As is the case in any other concept in accounting standards, everything begins with recognition, that is when is the financial instrument included in the entity's balance sheet, then there is the requirement of initial measurement, followed by subsequent measurement and eventually it leads to derecognition as the case may be. These three aspects are dealt by in DS 109. But before recognition or derecognition of an asset or liability, it is important to understand what the instrument gets classified as. Is it equity in nature? Is it liability in nature? Is that liability a liability or not? Or that can be accounted for as equity, given respect to the fact that in DS are driven to recognize substance over legal form. So what is the positioning of these instrument in the financial statements? Does it land in the equity section or the liability section? All these aspects are dealt with by INDIAS 32 which deals with classification of liability and equity. INDIAS 32 also deals with provisioning of provisions of offsetting of financial assets with liabilities and vice versa where there are certain criteria to be met for the same. INDIAS 109 also deals with a new impairment model on financial assets and liabilities having the intent and provision to expected losses in the financial statements based on past trends, present conditions and forward looking statements so that proactively credit losses are provisioned much in advance before they are incurred. INDIAS 109 also deals with a very important aspect of hedge accounting which is a completely new concept dealing with accounting for hedging instruments. Also, we will discuss INDIAS 107 pertaining to disclosures, which lays down a plethora of disclosures which are required in the financial statements. So, if we see the implications on a financial instrument, we need to appreciate the fact that these three standards are required to be read, understood and diagnosed together. Before we get into the concepts provided in the standard, it is pertinent to understand the meaning of a financial instrument since everything depends firstly on whether the asset or liability or even the contract in question is a financial instrument or not. As per India's 32, financial instrument is any contract that gives rise to a financial asset of one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument of another entity. Each and every word of the definition has immense significance starting from the first word contract. With respect to financial instruments, the term contract and contractual refers to agreement between two or more parties that has clear economic consequences which the parties have little or no discretion to avoid since usually in a contract the agreements are enforceable by law. The term contract, contractual rights and contractual obligations are fundamental to the definition of financial instrument, financial asset and financial liability. We all know contractual rights and contractual obligations are the rights and obligations that arise out of a contract. Assets and liabilities that are not contractual in nature are not financial assets or financial liabilities even though it may result in the receipt or delivery of cash. Most contracts give rise to a variety of rights and obligations and those might change or be added as the contract is performed. 
accordingly some may fall within the definition of a financial instrument and some may not for example an unperformed contract for the purchase or sale of a tangible asset usually give rise to rights and obligations to exchange a physical asset for a financial asset but these rights and obligation do not represent a financial instrument why because here the contractual right to receive cash is not matched with the other party's contractual obligation to pay cash under the same contract once the physical asset has been delivered a debtor or creditor will usually arise and this will be a financial instrument in each case one party's contractual right to receive or obligation to pay cash is matched by the other party's corresponding obligation to pay or right to receive cash meaning that each case is an example of a financial instrument coming to the second part uh which is the contract that gives rise to a financial asset of one entity and a financial liability or equity instrument of another entity of course from a journal entry standpoint if something gets debited another thing gets credited therefore if something is a financial asset of one entity there is also an equivalent financial liability or equity instrument of another entity so as we saw financial instruments are financial assets financial liabilities and equity financial instruments can also be segregated into primary financial instruments like receivables payables equity instruments and derivative financial instruments like financial options futures and forwards and interest rate swaps coming to the definition of equity as provided in india's 32 equity is any contract that evidences a residual interest in the net asset of an entity well the more simplistic this definition looks the more complex and relevant its implications are anything that is left in the balance sheet after paying off the creditors after returning the loans to the banks and after realizing all the assets is nothing but equity as we already know assets minus liabilities results in equity in the context of financial instrument standard it is particularly relevant because the definition of equity and its applications takes several contours and one really needs to look at the critical aspects the critical terms in a contract to arrive at whether it is really equity or liability examples of equity are ordinary shares share warrants mandatory convertible preference shares well while in most of the situations the above example would be equity however there are situations where the above would be classified as financial liability what point i'm trying to make here is that equity being any contract that have residual interest in the net asset of the entity this definition is also a residuary category that is in classifying a financial instrument as a liability or equity equity classification is appropriate only if the instrument fails the definition of a financial liability hence it is very important for us to understand what a liability is uh, financial liability is since whatever is not a financial liability is nothing but an equity instrument so coming to the definition of a financial liability a financial liability is a contractual obligation so first of all it is a contract there has to be a contract to deliver cash or other financial asset to another entity if there is an obligation okay if you can be obliged that is in any circumstance one could be obliged to pay cash or transfer any other financial asset or to exchange financial asset or liabilities under potentially unfavorable conditions now what is a potentially unfavorable condition let's take an example for example a limited has issued a call option that is an option to buy to mr x to subscribe to a limited's equity shares at a price of rupees 50 per share and this call option is to be settled on a net basis that is there is there need not be a physical delivery of the shares now if at the balance sheet date the market value of the equity shares of a limited is 55 per share a limited would be obliged to pay mr x rupees 5 to settle the option right such a condition is potentially unfavorable to a limited and hence rupees 5 represents a financial liability for a limited so summing up the first part of the definition there has to be a contract there has to be an obligation and the obligation must be to deliver cash or any other financial asset to another entity or one could really uh, not pay but just exchange financial assets and liabilities but those conditions need to be unfavorable being favorable it would turn into a financial asset coming to the second part of the definition being slightly more complex where there are those instruments which are not settled in cash 
rather settled by entity by transferring its own equity instruments. So let's look at the principle. A contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instrument and is for just once let's ignore the word derivatives and keep it simple and further we shall bring in them to read in totality. So a contract that will that means it is certain or maybe that means there is a likelihood settled in the entity's own equity instrument and this needs to be evaluated whether it is equity or not for the entity and there is either a potential settlement or a certain settlement that may happen and that contract for which the entity consciously ignoring the word derivative is or may be obliged again this includes a potential as well as a certain obligation where the entity may be or is obliged to deliver a variable number of entities own equity instrument the most important word here is a variable number so summing up the first part of the second aspect of the definition a contract in which there is a likelihood that the entity will give its own equity instrument and those equity instruments are variable in number such an instrument would become a financial liability now bringing in the concept of derivative and non-derivative well a derivative is essentially an instrument against which there is almost nil or negligible initial outflow or inflow by the investor visually the option premium why a negligible initial investment since you are not buying the underlying, you are just buying the right to buy the underlying. Similarly, a non-derivative is an instrument where the actual cash flows or inflows takes place for the underlying directly. That means it is not an option premium size payment, rather directly the whole instrument is exchanged or to be precise, it is not a right to exchange the instrument, it is exchange of the instrument itself. Now, if that is the situation, that is a non-derivative contract, for which uh, the entity is or may be obliged to deliver a variable number of entities own equity instrument a, deriv a non-derivative for which the entity is or may be obliged to deliver a variable number of the own equity instrument or uh, then this will be a financial liability since the underlying thought behind such an arrangement by the entity giving its equity instrument is using its own equity instrument as a currency as anyways the number of equity shares are not fixed that is the intent is not to give ownership through shares rather using the shares ju as just a settlement medium the above understanding primarily follows substance than just legal form due to which we see there is a thin line of difference between debt and equity classification of a financial instrument in classifying a financial instrument as a liability or equity, equity classification is appropriate only if the instrument fails the definition of financial liability. We already discussed that. So coming to the second part, a derivative that will or may be settled other than by exchange of a fixed amount of cash or another financial asset for a fixed number of entities own equity instruments. So here we see that the number of shares is fixed. However, the consideration is variable based on an underlying which would fluctuate on an index other than market price of the equity instrument itself. For example, a contract for entity to deliver 100 of its own equity instruments in return for an amount of cash collected to equal the value of 100 ounces of gold. That can be an example in that. Since this would not evidence a residual interest in the entity's assets after deducting all of its liabilities, this cannot be regarded as equity. In turn, this is a financial liability. As I already mentioned, there is a thin line of difference between debt and equity classification of a financial instrument. Indias 32 specifically provides a mirror image definition for equity in comparison to the definition of financial liability so that stepwise first we analyze the instrument with the definition of financial liability if it doesn't meet the same we apply the definition of equity as given in this slide and accordingly classify the instrument so financial liability uh, financial instrument is an equity instrument if both the criteria are met that is both criteria are required to be met together that there is no obligation to deliver cash in no circumstances whatsoever the entity could be asked to pay cash or any financial asset or to exchange financial asset or liability or other financial asset or to exchange financial asset or financial liability and the issuer will exchange fixed amount of cash or another financial asset for a fixed number of its own equity instruments 
only then it shall be classified as equity therefore does the entity have an unavoidable contractual obligation if yes then it is a financial liability and if the obligation is avoidable then it is equity coming to some examples of financial liabilities the first one finance lease obligation a financial liability or not so we ask is there a contract in a finance lease answer would be yes is there an obligation yes is that obligation to pay certain amount of cash yes so obviously it is a financial liability next would be financial guarantees given now what is a financial guarantee a financial guarantee is a contract whereby one party guarantees the performance of the other party and in case the other party does not perform the former agrees to compensate another third party for the damage that has been incurred either in terms of a loan that could have been taken or a specific performance that was not fulfilled by the second party so it is the contract yes it is a contract is there a contractual obligation well yes there is and could that lead to outflow of cash yes so it is a financial liability next tax liability whether it is a financial liability answer would be no since tax liability arises due to a statutory obligation than a contractual one which is imperative for it to be a financial liability therefore it is not a financial liability a non refundable revenue received in advance well often there are situations where certain customers pay advance to their suppliers or service providers and those amounts are not refundable but against those amounts the service provider has pro has to provide certain services or the supplier has to supply certain goods now is there a contract well yes there is is there an obligation yes what is the obligation to pay cash or other financial asset well no the obligation is to deliver services or to deliver goods so as a result it doesn't meet the definition of a financial liability even though it is a liability it would be shown as a deferred revenue as a non financial liability next redeemable shares with discretionary dividends okay the shares are redeemable that means the principal amount has to be paid but the dividends are discretionary now what are those instruments is there a contractual obligation yes there is and is that contractual obligation to pay cash yes therefore such instrument are liability instrument and they can also be equity instrument now why do we say so we say so because there is a possibility that the dividends may not be paid by the issuer and such a right in the hands of the issuer leads to an equity classification so when we have two components combined together what we have is a compound financial instrument now let's delve deeper into it and understand what is a compound financial instrument as the name suggests compound instrument is an instrument that has got both components both liability as well as equity an instrument whose terms indicate that it contains a liability feature and an equity feature it results in a compound instrument and it leads to split accounting now split accounting means accounting for liability and equity components separately and the equity component must meet the definition of equity and it is always calculated as a residual now simply put every instrument has to be seen corresponding to its components and each component has to be analyzed in the light of the contractual terms and conditions the moment a component meets the definition of equity we need to see whether there are two components or whether there is a single component and it is calculated as a residual now let's see some examples of compound instruments first is an instrument which is a redeemable preference share with discretionary dividend now this instrument has two components liability component being the fact that principal is going to get redeemed and the equity component being the fact that dividend is discretionary in nature the second is an example of a convertible bond where the conversion option is with the holder what is the liability component here it is the principal redemption and interest payment on the bonds what is the equity component there the fact that the holder has a convertibility option that is the equity kicker which means this instrument is attractive than a plain vanilla bond so this can be seen as a crucial aspect which culminates from the definitions of liability and equity both are mirror image definitions of each other as we have seen already now one would need to look at whether both the components are present in the financial instrument to determine whether that instrument 
is to be classified as a single instrument or has to be severally classified. Coming to the definition of financial assets. Financial assets is cash by default. Cash is by default a financial asset. It is an equity instrument of another entity. For example, investment in shares of XYZ Limited. That is a financial asset of the entity. Now a contractual right. Now the next two clauses are mirror image definition, mirror image of the definition of financial liabilities. The financial liability had contractual obligation. Here it is contractual right to receive cash. There it was contractual obligation to deliver cash or another financial asset from another entity. Favorable conditions over there it was unfavorable. And I had pointed out if that turns into favorable it would be classified as a financial asset so that's what's here so if a contract settlement is unfavorable for one and favorable for the other then only it shall be a financial liability for one and a financial asset for the other and in turn making it a financial instrument a contract that will or may be settled in the entity's own equity instrument and is a non-derivative for which the entity is or may be obliged to receive a variable number of entities own equity instruments. The moment there is a variability, the entity will receive a variable number of its own equity instrument. There it was an obligation to issue own equity instrument, but the number is variable. Now, or a derivative that will or may be settled other than by exchange of a fixed amount of cash other than means that it will be exchanged by a exchange of variable amount of cash other than fixed is equivalent to variable or another financial asset for a fixed number of entities own equity instruments so the number of equity instruments is fixed but the cash that will be received is variable that's again a financial asset for the entity and it's a derivative. Measurement of derivative is always done at fair value, which we'll see in further slides. Some examples of financial assets are first bank balances. We said cash is by default a financial asset. Well, that would include bank balances as well. Shares of sub companies are the financial assets, shares of subsidiary companies. Yes, because they are equity instruments of another entity. Advance given for purchase of goods. When customer gives an advance to supplier, what does it expect in return? Cash or goods? Well, it expects goods, not cash. Therefore, the instrument is regarded as a non-financial liability. So in the financial statements, you will not follow the principle for measurement for financial assets. You will measure it as per the relevant index. In this particular situation, it is an advance. So advance will stay in the books as its value at which it is which it is given and will convert into inventory whenever the goods are received prepaid expenses prepaid expenses are quite similar to an advance given for purchase of goods and therefore the conclusion is same it is not a financial asset deferred tax asset what does a deferred tax asset represent it represents the rights that are available to the company or the allowances that would be available to the company towards payment of taxes in future is there a contract? No, deferred tax asset arises due to a statutory provision of the Income Tax Act. It is calculated, uh, it is calculated by accounting standards. But deferred tax asset purely arises because there is a tax obligation in the Income Tax Act. Therefore, deferred tax assets are not financial assets. Lease deposit paid, lease deposits paid are refundable in cash, so it's a contractual right to receive cash, and therefore these are financial assets. Now, coming to initial measurement of financial instruments. Well, initially, all financial assets, liabilities, they are initially recognized at fair value. Now, fair value has to be determined in accordance with other standard. In our situation, it will be index 113. Index 113 fair value measurement had laid down certain approaches for calculating fair values. It broadly classifies the valuation, broadly classifying the instrument with respect to the methodology of fair valuation and it calls them level 1, level 2, level 3 fair value. Level 1 being the most observable and directly relatable to the market. Level 2 being lesser reliable but primarily uses inputs from observable market inputs. Level 3 being an entirely 
internal valuation where the usage of market based input is extremely limited all these three are methods of fair valuing a financial instrument now that is the first concept to be remembered that every financial instrument has to be measured on day one at its fair value the second concept that one must remember is fair value for a financial instrument is ordinarily the transaction price for that instrument so unless the transaction price is not reflective of fair value which could be in situation when two related parties deal with each other in such situation one may need to benchmark the transaction to an arm's length basis but ordinarily two unrelated party would transact with each other on an arm's length basis and therefore the amount that they would initially exchange would be assumed to be fair value however if fair valuation has been done based on level 3 input as i just mentioned then the difference in fair value and the transaction price shall be amortized over the life of the instrument and will not be immediately recognized in pl well but if the fair valuation has been done based on level 1 input then the difference in fair value and the transaction price that is the day zero gain or loss is recognized in pl immediately now with this understanding let us look at the crucial aspect with respect to transaction cost transaction cost are primarily the incremental costs that are directly attributable to the acquisition or issue or disposal of a financial asset or liability examples are the broke courage paid when investing in mutual funds shares etc also the processing fees etc in procuring a procuring a loan indbs provides that the transaction costs that are incurred on a financial instrument which is fair value through profit and loss would be immediately recognized in pl on initial recognition well a fair fair value through profit and loss as we uh, popularly know fetpl is a medium of fair value the changes the, the changes of fair value hit the profit and loss account okay which we are going to see further while we discuss the subsequent measurements and the transaction costs that are incurred on a financial instrument which is fair value through other mediums other than profit and loss account would be required to be adjusted to the initially recognized value of the financial asset or liability visually in case of financial asset it would be added and deducted in case of financial liability coming to the subsequent measurement of financial asset this would be this actually this is the most crucial and judgmental concepts in indias 109 uh, in relation to financial asset there are two broad models for subsequent measurement first is the amortized cost second is fair value and within fair value we have two choices one is fvtpl which is fair value through profit and loss and one is fvoci that is fair value through other comprehensive income other comprehensive income being the second part of the pl uh, that is provided in indias 1 now when to adopt which model is given in indias 109 which will ex intensively di diagnose the principles of subsequent measurement but before that let's understand the concept of amortized cost now what is amortized cost when we take a loan from a bank let's say for a car or a home loan etc the bank provides us a schedule the name of that schedule is called amortization schedule now why is it called amortization schedule because the concept of amortized cost is exactly same as the concept of amortization amortization or amortized cost is the amount initially recorded so you took a loan of 10 lakh to get the car that's the amount initially recognized minus the principal repayments for example you have paid out that principal of 3 lakhs till date plus or minus cumulative amortization using eir let's ignore the words eir that is effective interest rate for once and let's focus on cumulative amortization now cumulative amortization means the interest accrual thereon the interest accrual thereon let's say 1 lakhs rupees so 10 lakhs minus 3 lakhs of the amount of principal repaid plus 1 lakh rupees of interest 10 minus 3 7 plus 1 8 therefore 8 lakh is the amortized cost therefore amortized cost is nothing but the balance outstanding or the run down of the cost after accruing for any interest charges and after deducting any principal repayments Uh, minus impairments okay impairments in its simple word the same as the concept of provision for doubtful debts 
as an Indian gap as per AS4 or AS29. Those provisions for doubtful debts under India's uh, under AS9 as discussed sep under India's 109 are discussed separately as the expected credit loss model. We will get back. We will get into it. For the time being, this can be seen that the amortized cost is net of the impairment, if any, in the financial asset. Effective interest rate is the rate that exactly discounts the expected stream of future cash payments or receipts through maturity to the net carrying amount at initial recognition. So we have a net carrying amount at initial recognition, right? This uh, That is the transaction cost which we discussed in context of initial recognition just in the last, uh, last two slides. We had said that in the context of financial assets, the transaction cost is to be added to the financial asset. So the amount of initial recognition is let's say rupees 100 and 5 rupees transaction cost incurred that will be 105. Whatever are the cash flows whose present value exactly discounts back to 105, that rate achieved, this is the EIR or IRR in plain simple words. And there is no option to use straight line method to do the amortization. So the initial cost we incurred that cannot be amortized on a straight line basis. It has to be amortized on an effective interest rate basis. So this is the concept of amortized cost in relation to financial assets. So let's dive into the application of uh, subsequent measurement principles on financial assets. We first take three steps of financial assets into consideration. The first one is debt instrument held as financial asset. Now debt instrument is not a defined instrument in the standard. Debt instrument is understood as an instrument where the dates on which the cash flows would arise are predefined. So the first test that needs to be conducted by the entity is called the contractual cash flow test. It says do the contractual cash flows solely represent payment of principal and interest. Well this is popularly called the SPPI criterion. In crude words it means the contract between the parties involve nothing more than principal and or interest. It may involve principal as well like only the principal amount. So in other words, the cash flows should contain nothing else, no third element. Also the interest element here should not contain more than compensation for time value of money, credit risk, profit margin in basic lending arrangement, liquidity risk and the cost associated to hold the financial asset for a particular period of time. Only these five items can be there. Now if this test is failed. Then the instrument goes into a category called fair value through profit and loss, which is one of the subcategories that we just studied. But if this test is passed, the entity is required to conduct the second test called the business model test. Now the business model should tell you why the asset is held, that is what is the objective of holding it. The business model test is a matter of fact and not merely an assertion, that is it needs to demonstration based on past performance of the entity with evidence and it is a high level evaluation done by the KMPs of the entity. From the instrument perspective, BM test is a test which is conducted at a higher level than an individual debt instrument or for each and every portfolio, each and every asset, each and every segment. It is conducted at a higher level but slightly below the entity level since, any, since an entity can have more than one business model. Now, if the business model of the entity is to hold, hold and collect contractual cash flows, then the instrument is classified in a category called amortized cost, which we already discussed. An example would be debtors trade receivables. Normally entities end up holding the trade receivables to realize them upon the due date or subsequently and they do not transfer or move them to other entities. But I may have a business model where I may either collect contractual cash flows or I can even sell them. That is, the past history of my company suggests that my business model is mixed in nature. That is, we hold it and sell it too. For example, I have a portfolio of debtors that I usually get discounted or sell it off or due to asset liability management policies that is ALM policies where I downsell certain assets to match it with the duration of the liabilities that those assets fund primarily a requirement of financial instruments and NBFCs. So if the BM is combined, then we move into a fair valuing the debt instruments through OCI. That means that every financial reporting date 
the fair value changes of this instrument will go to OCI and further form part of other equity in the balance sheet. Now you can see it is written FPOCI with recycling. What does that mean? Recycling means bringing things back to their own shape or place where they actually belong. So fair value changes belonged to PL but you took them to OCI. Therefore now you were to recycle them to PL. But when? Only when the contractual rights to those cash flows expire. Simply saying whenever the contract comes to an end, whenever the asset is disposed of. So now those fair value changes which have been accumulated in OCI, they are recycled back in the PL and PL takes a hit. Here in both the scenarios, I also have a fair value option which I may elect. The standard gives a free flowing option to electing fair valuing through PL in which case the instrument is recognized as fair value through PL if not then the explained options as selected that is the amortized cost or FEOCI with recycling. Practically complete don't do for it since it is a hard call when, com when it comes to the volatility in the PL. People don't uh, generally fair value it through PL. Now if the business model of the entity is neither to collect contractual cash flows nor is the business model a mixed one that is the business model is to actually sell the contractual cash flows then we are left with no other option than to fair value it through PL. The second instrument category is derivative instrument held as financial asset. Derivative will obviously not fulfill the contractual cash flow characteristics test since derivative by their very definition don't have payments that are solely payment of principal and interest. And therefore very simply put ordinarily they would fail this requirement and all fair value changes will be recorded in profit and loss. Now there is one exception to this case that is hedge accounting which we will try to briefly touch upon later in this stage if time permits. For a crisp understanding derivatives are also used to do hedge accounting through which the gains or losses on a hedging instrument or a portion thereof is not recorded in PL upfront and is deferred in OCI and only recognized in PL at a later stage. However, that's an exception. So in generality, all derivatives are measured at fair value and fair value changes are ordinarily going to PL. The third instrument category is equity instrument held as financial assets. Equity instrument by their very nature fail the contractual cash flow test since cash flows are neither nor neither certain nor is there a case for anything in nature of an interest. The next question that we ask is whether the equity instrument is held for trading. Holding it for trading is defined in India's held for trading is defined in India's as India's essentially it says that the intent or the strategy of the management is to recognize early gains or losses without holding the asset to maturity. So whether it is held for trading, if yes, then the fair value changes are taken to PL. Well, a word of caution. The equity instrument are required to be tested on individual basis. That is, for the purpose of assessing whether they are held for trading, the instrument would be evaluated individually. Now, if we don't hold it for trading, then we ask a question. Whether I want to elect the fair value to be routed through OCI. Now, what's happening here? That the standard is giving an option appreciating the fact that equity instrument may be strategic in nature. For example, investments in startup in startup yeah investment in a startup would initially incur losses and if one would fair value these uh, investments they would keep coming down and all those fair value changes would go in the pnl and eventually trigger the volatility of my pnl however strategic investment is not a criteria here right? this is this is just a generally an option given if we don't choose this option by default, we go to the residual category that is FVTPL. If we choose this option, the fair value changes go in OCI but with no recycling. Here, no recycling implies that any fair value changes in respect of equity instruments are recognized in OCI and are never recycled back in PNL. So, this is how the flowchart of subsequent measurement of financial asset look like. Coming to subsequent measurement of financial liability. Like financial assets, there are two categories, one is amortized cost and other is FVTPL. There is no FVOCI which there is in case of financial assets. Let's start with FVTPL category. First is liabilities held for trading are measured through FVTPL. 
This is usually in cases of banks and financial instruments who have who have traded in their own liabilities to keep balancing out their portfolios. Many a times for ALM purposes, the banks and NBFCs, they balance out their portfolios of assets and liabilities. They bring them in tandem with each other so they may sell higher maturity liabilities or lower maturity liabilities as and when the complexion of their asset portfolio changes. This balancing of asset liability management makes the associate liabilities getting classified as held for trading. Derivative liabilities are anyways measured at fair value as well as contingent consideration recognized by an acquirer in a business combination. They are also always measured at FVTPL, that is fair value through profit and loss. The second one being amortized cost. Everything other than FVTPL, that is fair value through profit and loss, is measured through amortized cost, but not a finance lease obligation, since that is excluded from the purview of India's 109, that is covered by India's 116. Amortized cost in case of financial liability is exactly similar to that in case of financial asset, just with one difference, that is, there is no consideration for impairment in calculation since there is no impairment in case of financial liabilities. Coming to subsequent measurement of financial liabilities. Subsequent measurement of financial liabilities which are carried at fair value, the corresponding changes are recognized in PL. And other liabilities which are carried at amortized cost, they are carried at amortized cost. Now let's move to the next concept that is derecognition of financial assets. The first step that is all subsidiaries are required to be consolidated. That means one needs to look at derecognition requirements on a consolidated level and not at individual entity level because that would very well ignore the implications of derecognition on its subsidiary or any kind of SPV, uh, special purpose entity that the company might have created. The next is determining whether the derecognition principles are applied to a part or all of an assets. Okay, that means you have to apply uh, apply to all the assets which are part of that portfolio or group of assets. In the next question arise: Have the right to the cash from the assets expired? Now, when do the rights to the cash flows expire? when either you decide to relinquish or sacrifice the loans or the loan has come to an end. If yes, then you just derecognize the asset, book a gain or loss, whatever it is. Now a word of caution here, derecognition should not be confused with 100% impairment. What I mean is, contractually the cash flows should be gone. If contractually they exist and you have internally decided that the money will no more be recoverable, that does not give a clean shit to derecognize the asset. Now, if the cash flows are not expired, has the entity transferred its rights to receive the cash flows from the asset? Now, there are situations in case of securitization where the entities transfer the financial asset by entering into a novation agreement or something similar to that, whereby the rights to the financial assets are passed on to other entities. Now, if you have passed on the cash flows, you may go to the uh, further step and if the answer is no, then has the entity assumed an obligation to pay cash flows from the asset that meets the pass-through criteria. It means that the entity has assumed an obligation that is although it has not transferred the cash flows, the cash flows continue to remain or continue to uh, come to the entity first and as an obligation it is passed on to the other entities that is passed through. If they are not passed through, so neither the cash flows are transferred nor you have assumed an obligation to pass through then you have nothing else to do than to continue recognizing the asset but if the answer to the point is yes that is uh, yes you have done it then you have then you ask the next question has the entity transferred substantially all the risk and rewards here risk and rewards essentially pertain to risk of non collection credit risk or other major risk in the portfolio. So for example, if you have assigned a portfolio which already has default rate of 7% and you gave a guarantee to the assignee that you will bear losses up to 7 or 6.5 of the portfolio, essentially it means you have not transferred any risk or rewards and retain substantially all the risk and rewards. That means you will continue to recognize the asset. But if you have substantially transferred all the risk and rewards, 
you end up derecognizing the asset. But if you have not transferred the substantially all the risk and rewards, then you ask the next question that whether you have retained substantially all the risk and rewards. If the answer is yes to the same, you would continue to recognize the asset. However, if the answer is no, the next question would be whether the entity is retaining the control of the asset. That is, has the re entity retained the control of the asset? Now, control of the asset means the ability of an entity to pledge, sell or dispose of the asset in any manner that it desires. So, I have transferred a portfolio of debtors to another entity and that entity has a right to sell the portfolio, pledge it or take another loan. It would mean I have not retained control over the asset and therefore I would derecognize the asset. But if I have retained control, which means that another entity cannot sell the asset or pledge or take another loan against it, that would mean I have retained control and accordingly I would continue to recognize the asset. The next topic is impairment of financial asset, which has, imp which has new impairment model known as the expected credit loss model. IFRS 9, based on which India's 109 has been prepared, as a response, it, it, uh, IFRS 9 was basically prepared as a response to certain deficiencies which were noted in IS 39. IS 39 financial instrument standard that contained earlier provisions on impairment worked on a model called incurred loss model, which meant the impairment provisions in respect of a financial asset were recorded only upon happening of a certain event. Now, that is quite dissimilar to what we have as known as the RBI prudential norms, which mandates certain percentage of loan portfolios or other financial asset portfolios to be, provide, uh, to be provided for based on days past aging. That is not what is expected credit loss, but both of them share the same lineage as far as intentions matter. The intent of expected credit loss model is to provision the expected losses in financial statement based on past and present conditions and forward-looking statements so that proactively credit losses are provisioned much in advance before they are incurred. Now, what is this expected credit loss? Basically, it is present value of something called cash shortfall. Now, the cash shortfall is the difference between the contractual cash flows which are due to the entity and the cash flows the entity expects to receive out of it. The evaluation of the same is done by evaluating a range of possible outcomes at every reporting date. So you look at several points of time in future, what were the payments that were due and what are the payments expected? Any difference is expected credit loss. Not an expectation in extremes that is you need to appreciate usual events in the business to happen and with that vision you need to evaluate. It is an unbiased probability driven calculation reflecting a possible outcome. So it is a judgmental calculation and we need to assume probabilities of default etc. And it should always reflect a possibility of credit loss occurring or not occurring. Also the present value of the cash shortfall is required to be discounted at the effective interest rate or any other credit adjusted discounting rate. So that elements such as transaction cost are also considered. The expected credit loss model is applicable on financial assets ranging from debtors, loan commitment, intercorporate loans, lease receivables, financial guarantee contracts and debt instruments. You may see that lease receivables are excluded from India's 109. However, just for the purpose of derecognition and impairment, lease receivables are included here in the uh, expected credit loss model and incidentally, impairment model is applied on them. Now, when it comes to expected credit losses, there are two types of outlook or expectation scale to phrase it, which an entity foresee regarding the expectation of events that might hold out and result in a default. They are 12 month expected credit loss and lifetime expected credit losses. Both have different magnitudes, which we shall see in the coming slides. Now, if because of an event which is likely to occur in the next 12 months, there is a loss that could be incurred, then a provision for such event needs to be made and that provision is called 12 months expected credit loss.
well the loss may not occur in the coming 12 months however the event resulting in the credit loss is required to be considered so only uh, looking at the events up to the period of 12 months similarly lifetime expected credit losses are those expected credit losses that result from all possible defaults events over the expected life of a financial instrument now there is a three stage impairment model which primarily which is actually not given in not defined in india's 109 however hints are provided to the same which basically you need to stage down the credit quality as well as credit risk and accordingly stage it down and then recognize the ecl based on 12 months ecl and lifetime ecl now there is also a stepwise approach to impairment model which you can see on your uh, leisure time now coming to the last topic which is disclosures pertaining to financial instrument visually in days 107 with this we shall wrap up our session on financial instruments going on to the key disclosures of indes 107 the key objectives is to require the entities to provide disclosures that would enable users to evaluate the significance of financial instruments and the nature and extent of risk arising from financial instruments now we need to appreciate there certain risk that need to be brought out to the users such as interest rate risk liquidity risk credit risk and all of it should be portrayed in the financials and how the entity is managing them some key points to be explained like uh, liquidity risk liquidity risk is the risk that an entity may not have sufficient cash available to discharge its liabilities so in case of financial liabilities an entity may not have cash available at the point of time it is required to be able to discharge its liabilities credit risk is the inability of the counterparty to fulfill its obligation market risk would be basically interest rate risk and foreign currency risk etc now there are specifications to uh, notes that are required to be disclosed which are under other disclosures and we need to explain accounting policies fair value disclosures of all instruments measured at fair value including a level 1 level 2 level 3 hierarchy disclosure also we need to give details of assumptions and valuation techniques adopted similar to these there are many other disclosures required to be given in relation to several other aspects of financial instrument With this I would like to bring only this session to an end but the learning to keep on going you may check out our other resources on related topics and other pertinent topics relating to the corporate world by going on our website the presentation of this session can be accessed through link provided in the description of